niche uh, area of web design. It's something that's really popular and becoming big overseas in the US and the UK, just kind of taking off here um, as people start to understand that it's, it's really should form the core of the development of any website. And that can be a simple blog or it could be an e-commerce site, whatever it is. Obviously, for you guys, uh, the relevance is, is for blogging. Um, and I'll take you through why WordPress over anything else. Um, a little bit of sort of first steps. I know there's probably a range of experience and uh, abilities here. Some people have their own blogs with their own domain names. Some people maybe work for larger blogs. Some people don't have a blog at all yet. Um, so I'll just run over quickly some first steps. Um, and then run through some issues about basic usability, um, copy text, then images and galleries, uh, web video, maps, uh, and then what I call the social layer. And then finally, delight, which is kind of the thing that we all aspire to. Um, it's kind of the emotional icing on top of any kind of web experience that we you know, like to lay on top. Um, all of these things I'm going to go through, I'm going to explain practical ways that you can improve a WordPress blog uh, to achieve these kind of, or to achieve being better in these different areas of, of your website. So there are some URLs and stuff relating to things that you can find online. Um, I'll make the presentation available online. We can email you guys with the link to it so you don't have to worry about writing down HTTP colon bang um, but yeah, I've tried to keep it a mixture between sort of um, practical and then also a little bit inspiring so you can see things that other people have done that are really exciting. So first of all, what is user experience or UX design? Well, um, I like to, because obviously being uber geek kind of person, uh, liken it to the matrix. So if you imagine that in the matrix, you know, they had that thing plugged into the back of their head and they could experience this full world of um, not just things that they were seeing and smelling, but also things that they were feeling, you know, and people would fall in love inside the matrix. And it, it was completely to do with these you know, neur neurons, sorry, firing inside their brain. Um, these things that they were experiencing had this huge effect inside their brain. And that's really the reality that they, that they inhabit. It's, it's, um, and it's hugely important to them. So um, for a long time, you know, websites were built um, from the perspective of how do I display this information or um, how do I allow this book to be downloaded or how do I show this picture? Instead of focusing on, you know, I know that someone's going to be coming to this website and they're going to be sitting at a screen looking at it and they're going to be experiencing something. And once we start to shift the focus to um, that as being the central point, you start to create much better websites, much better blogs, much better experiences for people um, by, by focusing on them. So, you know, the, the sort of central tenet or the, the fundamental basis for user experience design is, um, is always thinking about um, your, your user, which is, you know, or your reader or your, your audience, and putting them at the, focus, at the center of everything you do. So every decision you make, um, you've got to realize that um, it, should be, it should be centered around thinking about the person that's going to be reading your blog um, or looking at your photos or whatever it is. And it's also important to realize that every decision you don't make is also, you're also actually making a decision. So if you don't decide to, to think about the way that you lay out your copy, or the way that you present your photos, you are actually making a decision and you're, you present, you're creating an experience in someone's mind that might be worse than something you could have done. Um, so sort of a, a fundamental thing as well about, about user experience design is usability, which is, you know, usability is something that um, is, is a big part of physical product design. So from your kettle to your toaster to, you know, Golf GTI, um, usability is just basically making something easy to use. And making something easy to use is making sure that people don't have to think when they use it. And we all know there's a bunch of really, really crap websites out there. The majority are crap. Um, you can't find what you're looking for. Um, you know, it's hard for you to engage in the content. You don't really feel like you relate to the website at all. It's just a mere nothingness. So usability is a big sort of baseline component to that. Um, another layer on top is, is what is called information architecture. Um, and don't worry about these terms. It's not really important. What's, what's important is what they represent and what they mean. So information architecture is about structuring the, the content on your website. So a simple example would be, say you have a, a blog that combines food and travel. You could either maybe have it centered around food. So your main navigation, for example, could be linking to desserts, main courses, starters. And then within that, you could have you know, all main courses from various different parts of the world. Or you could choose to have it by country. So you could have Europe or continent Europe, Africa, Asia. And within each one, you could have different kinds of food. Now, that's a fundamental shift in the, in the, the structure of your, your blog or your website. Um, and you'd make that decision based on thinking about who's going to be coming and visiting the site and, and what would make most sense to them. Not just what makes most sense based on the articles I've got or the videos that I've got, but what makes most sense to the people that are coming to visit. So if it's really food industry people or people who are interested in food, then it makes sense to structure around food rather than countries. If it's, uh, if it's a subcomponent on a travel site, perhaps you'd rather do it by country. So that's information architecture. It's just categorizing content, and it's as simple as that, really. Um, you know, on top of that, then it's just about creating this kind of 
comfortable space, you know, this space online that people can sit in for half an hour in front of the screen and really enjoy and easily find new content that you've got. Um, it's about five, you know, making it easy to navigate um, and just an enjoyable experience rather than a kind of stressful one or an annoying one. So on to why WordPress. Um, you know, WordPress is kind of the most popular platform out there, and a lot of people are aware of it, but there's loads of others. There's, there's Blogspot, or Blogger, I think the same thing, used to be the same thing. Um, there's, there's Joomla, there's Drupal, all these sort of techie platforms that exist that you can create a blog on. Um, so the big question is, why WordPress? Why do I think WordPress is, is the best one? Um, number one, everybody's doing it. So 50 million WordPress sites out there, which is obviously a huge amount. Um, so Cameron said there were 200 million travel blogs. So obviously, only a quarter of them are, or even if all of them were using WordPress, it would only be, uh, oh sorry, no, not all of them could be using WordPress. Um, but And this picture I ripped off of the WordPress website. So most of them are hosted on WordPress.com. And I'll explain a little bit more about that just now. Um, it's really simple to use as the person who's writing on it. So you know, from my perspective, from my perspective, it's, it's not only important that the people who are reading your blog are finding it easy. It's got to be easy for you guys to work on it as well. You don't want something where you're spending hours you know, uploading a photo and attaching it to a certain blog or inserting a video and the whole thing's a mission. Um, so WordPress is really clean, easy. You can see even without reading what's on there. It just, it's laid out nicely. It's pretty easy to learn. Um, that's another great reason why WordPress is, is a number one choice. After that, themes. So themes are basically the skin, the way that your blog looks. Um, and you know, it can be really simple. It can be a matter of just different text colors, um, different ways that the links are styled, stuff like that. Or it can be a really elaborate design thing. I mean, this is, for example, just a theme which you can download for free. and you plug it into your blog, and your blog suddenly looks like a professionally designed website. So on WordPress, there are thousands, if not millions, of themes available, um, most of which are free, um, and then some of which, and some of which that are very sort of uh, functional, really amazing, um, you'll pay for. And even the paid for ones are usually as cheap as like 35 US dollars, so it's about 300 rand. It's not a big deal. Um, so themes allow you to you know, create a fairly unique and professional veneer on top of your website that allows people to connect with it in a much more visceral way than just you know, a bunch of text on a gray background like most blogs actually are. Another huge component of WordPress is what are called plugins. So plugins are little bits of functionality, and it could be something like an image gallery, um, even something as, as sort of uh, advanced as an e-commerce platform. So you could decide to sell ebooks about your travels, for example. Um, you can easily get what's called a plugin for WordPress. You can chuck it in there. Um, it's fairly easy to install. And immediately, you've got that functionality to play with. And once again, throughout the, through the back end, it's pretty easy to interact with. So WordPress, over a lot of other platforms, has a huge diversity of plugins that are really easy to use. Um, and you can achieve all kinds of things. If you can think about it, if you can dream of this idea for a website, you can usually achieve it pretty easily um, with WordPress and various themes and plugins. Which feeds into the next point, which is that it's hugely flexible and adaptable. If you see you know, the kind of things that people are doing with WordPress now, even though it started off as just a blogging platform, it's, you know, people are building, as I said, e-commerce sites, um, purely sort of YouTube cloned sites, all kinds of things can be built just out, of, just out of WordPress. And it's also, you don't have to decide in the beginning for this grand vision for your travel blog. You can start off just with a simple travel blog where you're, you're writing posts like normal and you're posting some pictures. Um, at a later stage, if you've chosen WordPress as a base in the beginning, it's easy for you then to either adapt it yourself or, you know, hire, there's loads of WordPress developers um, to, to craft it into something more than it was. There's, there's a blog, um, Sarah, you might be able to remind me of the name, guys who travel around to various places at the moment in Africa, and they sell things that they buy in these countries. Um, Vagabond Adventures. So um, with something like WordPress, you can easily do that. You can start off with a blog, and you start to see that you're getting traffic and you're getting a decent, decent audience, and later you'll find out ways of, um, of monetizing your blogs. But one way could be to actually sell physical products. And you know, having chosen WordPress, it's an easy task then to add that onto the website and start selling things via PayPal or however you want to do it. Um, another one, short codes. I couldn't really find an appropriate image <laughs> for some reason, so just thought I'd choose a short pants instead. Um, short codes are not really um, a WordPress-specific thing, but it's basically, um, with plugins, you don't have to understand that you know, the programming behind a plugin, often it's as simple as getting what they call a short code. So the plugin will provide you and have a nice little helpful manual on this. Um, so you might have something like, in a post, you just literally put in square brackets, you know, cute, whatever the short code is, so it'll just be a bit of text. Um, 
And then when someone comes to your site, they might see something as elaborate as this. So I, it's not obviously animated, but you can have different pictures and this thing's flipping around in three dimensions and it looks amazing. And you know, that's going to make your blog completely different to some other person who has just written a basic blog. Um, and you know, this might not be the best thing for travel blogging, but just to illustrate that you can get these mad kind of interactive, really visually um, delightful things on your blog. And as a travel blogger, you didn't have to learn how to program this thing or to code this thing. You just had to know, I read the manual and I put this one word in square brackets into my blog post. You know, it takes a little bit of learning to get there, and, but all this stuff is available to find out online, and you can actually produce these amazing experiences in a really easy way. The last reason for, for WordPress, um, mobile. And you know, I'm not gonna, it's not about people being able to read your blog on mobile. That's a whole other side of things which is completely possible. But rather, WordPress produces um, its own sort of apps for every platform. These are the, the top three, but there was Nokia, um, Web OS, which is a Palm operating system. But basically, you can have that application. You can be anywhere. You can take a photo. You can write a post, a small one. Um, and it allows you to blog much more frequently, much more easily when you're on the move, and just upload straight into your WordPress blog. And it's, you know, those things are designed for mobile, really easy to use. You're not cramming a whole web, like, blog backend on your, on your mobile phone. Um, so that's pretty awesome, I think, especially for travel blogging, where you could be anywhere in the world, or you could just be out for lunch, and you, know, you want to write a short post about this meal that you t you're having. You can take two photos add them on, take you two minutes, and it's, it's a blog post, right? So first steps, domain names and installation. I'll go through this quite quickly, because I know it's already relevant to, to a lot of you, but um, it might be of, of some interest. So I was saying um, earlier when I had the 50 million blog posts thing up that that was something I would stole from WordPress.com. So um, WordPress.com is like blogspot.com, and you'll see a lot of people who have blogs will have, you know, myblog.wordpress.com, or, you know, I love cupcakes. Um, blogspot.com. So that's cool, and you know your blog is out there, and search engines can can index your content, and people can find your blog. But you don't have full control over the the experience, firstly, because you're you're tied down to using whatever that website is providing for you. So if it's WordPress.com, you are you know you, you can't add any plugin to that. You can't completely change the look and feel to anything you want. And then also, if you're putting advertising on your site, you often might be sharing the ad revenues with someone. Uh, you might be, not be completely free to sell advertising if your blog gets really popular and that's something you want to do. So you know, the answer is to have your own domain name. You host it yourself, and you're then completely free to do whatever you want. And if it gets big and popular and you want to have a developer work on it and add more to it, um, this is the first step, and it's something that's completely um, essential. So in South Africa, you know, there's various different hosting suppliers, various different um, ways that you can get your own domain name. But I mean, some of you may know, but you know, a domain name costs 100 rand a year. It's not, a, it's not a lot. So if you can find a domain name that you like and it's, it's available, and if you go to any of these sites, you'll be able to search and find if this name is available. 100 bucks a year, that's all you need. And hosting can be as cheap through MWeb, but I must say, not that great. Um, 19 rand a month. Otherwise, it can be like 100 bucks a month. So you know, it's, that's how much it costs. Um, the installation process. On, on lots of hosting suppliers, so something like Hetzner will have just one click install, which is great for people who aren't really interested in getting involved in installing things on a web server. Obviously, most people aren't. Um, but you see WordPress, click, choose my name, install, done. And then you just go to the back end, and you never have to worry about what's on the server or anything like that. You just log into your site, create your posts, and it's all, it's all good to go. Um, otherwise, even the hardcore techie install of WordPress, you'll probably be able to find a geek friend who can do it, because the famous thing is this five minute install process. So also not a, not a kind of big um, mission to install it. OK, so now on to the, the less uh, boring stuff. So basic usability. Um, usability kind of forms the, the, the fundamental or the foundation of, of a good user experience online. Um, and that goes, that's as true as it is, it's as true for a travel blog as it is for, for Amazon or someone like that. So you know, there's fundamental things about usability itself, which which are really important to know. So it's really on a website concerning allowing people to navigate through the site as easily as possible, which means finding what they want to find. So if I've come to a travel blog, you know, sometimes you just follow one travel blog because you love the way they write, and you're happy just to read everything that they write. But other times, if it's a bigger site, you know, maybe on the getaway blog, you want to come there and you want to find what posts have been written just about Zambia or just about whitewater rafting, or whatever it is. So you know, a site with good usability will allow you to find that without going through a hassle of exploring what's in all these different menus and and trying to find stuff and not being, um, not achieving what you're looking for. So there's basic things. You know, links should look like links. You get links that look like all kinds of things now, and people don't know. 
uh, what they are. You know, the logo should be linked to your homepage. And you know, it doesn't matter that these are these points I'm saying, but there are these fundamental things that, uh, that exist online that just help people use your website much more easily. Um, navigation should be clear and obvious. So all this kind of stuff, it's good to achieve this kind of stuff. And the great thing about WordPress is that if you choose a good theme, usually all this stuff will be taken care of and you won't even have to think about it. Because to be honest, obviously you don't really want to spend your time thinking about what color your links should be or should they be underlined or should they not be underlined. You just want to produce content and get it out there. But you also want your content to be, to be um, consumed in a lot and in the most easy way possible and for people to want to share it. So this is important stuff to get, to get right in the first place. Um, the cube, love the cube. Um, <laughs> cool, so the first thing, writing, obviously the sort of the base component of most people's travel blogging will be writing. Um, and most people get this stuff wrong online, presenting writing um, in the interface of your blog. How do you do it so that people can engage with it easily? Um, and you know, a lot of this stuff has been touched on by, by Cameron and by Marriott in the beginning. Um, avoid big chunks of dense, dense text. That's just a fundamental no-no. You know, you're not reading a newspaper, you're not reading a novel. It's usually, okay, as Cameron was saying, on a tablet things can be different. But if you're on a screen, the screen is glary, it's shining in your eyes, it's not great to read on. You know, you don't want to arrive on a site and just see a whole load of text. It's, it's very um, alienating and people don't really want to engage with it if they can't see the end point of where they're getting to. So, you know, this is, a, this is a, you know, something that's important for all websites, not just blogs and not just travel blogs. So the answer to that is to make scannable text um, with helpful you know, web formatting. And once again, so something like WordPress, it has a, a great, pretty simple to use text editor in the background. So you can easily create bullet points and you know, subheadings which are bold, whatever it might be. It's, it's not important what the actual styling is, but just to be aware that if I can look at a page as soon as it loads up and it looks like it's digestible and cut into chunks, um, it's much easier for me to work through and I'm more likely to read through the whole thing than if it loads up you know, and, and it's just straight text. Because also a lot of people are reading this stuff at work, especially in South Africa. You're on a lunch break, you know, and you're kind of like eating a sandwich and drinking coffee, and you're saying, oh. Um, yeah, so you can see on this page, there's subheadings, there's little sections, you know, that are in bold, and there's lots of white space, doesn't look too dense. Um, little questions, bullet points, and it's WWF, so it's kind of travel related. Um, so one, practical way that you can do this in WordPress is something called pagination, which is basically splitting something that could have been one huge long website or white web page into multiple pages that you, you go through by clicking next page, next page. I mean, you all have seen these kind of things on, on websites, uh, and there are plugins for that, of course. So there's a couple of web addresses. Don't worry if you don't want to write them down. Um, so yeah, th this is less for on a, on a single story, because I'm not going to say, I don't know that it's better to split a single story into multiple pages. That's obviously a bit annoying, because you have to wait for the page to load. But more if you think of it as someone, when they arrive on your blog homepage, do you want to have this huge, sort of overwhelming, massive blog post that I just scroll and scroll through? Or do you just have the top four, or the most popular four, and then you go to the next page, and you go to the next page? Um, there's some things that, you know, for me that are a concern is things like load time, especially in South Africa, where people don't have hugely fast internet speeds. You know, if you have lots of photos on your blog, for example, you don't want people to have to wait for 100 photos to load on that page. It might take five minutes. Um, you rather split up the content. It takes much quicker for the page to load. People can engage with the content quicker, and for them, it feels effortless and seamless. Um, it's also really great for ad impressions as well. So if you have ads, obviously, if they go to a new page, it's a new impression for the ad, and you get paid a little bit more. So that's a kind of sneaky way that people make more money um, out of advertising. And you'll find it's kind of, this is where you can uh, risk getting uh, sort of impacting uh, badly on the user experience is when you have those sites where what a story that could have just been one page that you could scroll through and you're happy to are split up into kind of five pages. And it's like, oh, I read one paragraph, next page, wait for it to load. And the reason that they usually do that is because they're going to get five ad impressions out of you rather than just one. So that's something to be aware of. You know, if, if, you, if you think you can do it and you make money out of it, then that's cool to do. But I think it impacts negatively on, on the overall experience of someone reading your blog. So another way to split up content, and there's a the sort of technical term in user experience parlance is called progressive disclosure. So what this means is that you, you, you give people a minimum amount of content on the page when it loads up for them to see the first time they see the page. But you allow them a really easy way to uncover more content if they want to and hopefully as immediately as possible. So not having to click a link and then wait for a page to reload. So progressive disclosure is just about basically giving people the signpost to uncover more content, and it usually could be text-based, um, without sort of shoving just loads down their throat at once. So two really popular ways of doing that are called tabs and accordions. So tabs are something most people are familiar with. 
tabs at the top, pretty obvious. So obviously I can click on where it says lorem ipsum, lorem ipsum, and immediately it'll change the tab and I'll see um, other content. So you know, a cool way that this could be done on a, a travel blog would be at, at the bottom of an article, perhaps you've got some helpful hints on places to stay, you know, maybe there's like restaurants to visit, and maybe there's a map or something. And instead of having that laid down so it's an even longer page, and you know, when the page loads up, it looks like there's even more content, you split it up into three tabs, and you can easily flick through it, and it's a much better experience. Accordions are pretty uh, similar. So accordions, you literally, you know, I click on this one, and it expands up, and it looks all cool because it's animated. But at the same time, it, you know, at any one time, I've only got one paragraph showing it instead of three. So these kind of things, and once again, couple of plugins for it. So these plugins, you, just, you can download them from within the back end of your, of your WordPress site. You can just search for um, these names. So it could be, I don't know why they call it the, the. I feel like it's some kind of weird thing to get them like, searched for easier if someone searches the, 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 the. Anyway, um, and another one, J shortcodes. Um, you, know, you can install these plugins, and immediately you'll get a little extra tab in your sidebar on your blog. It'll, say, Do you, you know, it'll tell you just exactly how to, to put tabs into your page or into your post, and you can pretty easily start, start using it. Um, cool. So that's text and copy. Uh, now on to, to images and galleries. So obviously you've seen, um, you know, and we've heard how much of a, an impact photography can, can make on a, on, a, on a travel blog. On websites generally, everyone knows that visuals are hugely important. You know, copy can ultimately be something that, that people engage with and they, they understand what to do on the site, but, but visuals are Firstly, they're, they're really great for sharing. You know, people share visual content, I think, a lot more than, than they do uh, sort of written content because you know that when you share a picture, it's, uh, that people are going to engage with it a lot easier than they will with, with text content. Um, so it's, you know, let's assume that we can all take decent photographs that people will want to look at. The next stage then is how do you present them on your, on your website? Because obviously you could just put them into a post, and that's cool. Um, uh, but there's, there's other cool things you can do to make it sort of a, a more seamless and more engaging experience for people to look, look through. So one thing is what is called, uh, generally called a, a light box. And you've probably seen this on some websites where you've got a bunch of little thumbnails, a bunch of little images. You click on one of them, and then the screen kind of can dim out, and then it, it, it sort of zooms in, and you've, you, you, know, you can see the photo at full size. Um, you can then close it, and it'll fade out, and you can go to another thumbnail, or perhaps you can go through next, previous. And a lot of websites have this these days, and it looks really funky, and it's, it's also really uh, usable um, in that you, know, you can also hold a lot of photos on one page without having a long page with huge photos. Once again, the page doesn't have to load up loads of huge photos, so it doesn't take lots of time to load up, so, uh, which is always you know, a crappy thing for user experience. So here's one example, fancy box. Um, you can even have a little caption on there. So and, you know, often these things are pretty cool, like you'll hover onto it and the thing slides up nicely. Once again, it's it's something that usually you'd expect to only be able to achieve from a professionally designed website, you know, or spending a bit of money on a developer to do something, which is not actually true. You can, you can achieve this stuff really easily um, with the use of plugins on WordPress. So another one, for example, Lightbox Plus. It's pretty much the same thing, but it dims out the background. And the reason that that's cool is, you know, you might have advertising on your blog, you might have all kinds of things going on. But for someone to really enjoy looking at a photograph and to really engage with it and remember it, you want to sort of isolate that experience for them. And to do that, just dimming out the background content on the site, which these plugins do automatically, allows them just to focus and you know, not even have to think about anything else except for experiencing your beautiful photography that you've spent all this time taking. Why not allow someone to really just experience only that? Um, and you know, the other thing as well is you know, the more memorable the experience is, the more they enjoy it, the more likely they are to share it, which obviously eventually spirals into, into more traffic and more success. Another one I personally really like is, uh, is something called, it's called the Galleria. It's you know, something that someone's coded up, a certain kind of gallery. It just looks really cool. It's really beautiful. Um, and as with most things, there's a plugin for that. So um, this one, you've got all the thumbnails. So you can have a whole gallery of you know, a certain trip, or you've, you've pieced together a gallery that you think makes sense together. And you can present that as a cohesive whole. You know, I click on one of the photos, and immediately it can just fade in and out. Um, it's much better than just sort of going to the next post, waiting for a page to reload. Like, with most of the other things I've been talking about. Um, you know, and you can have little captions that people can choose to either see or not, which is, which is really cool, and it allows you to create you know, multiple galleries that you can understand on the back end. So you could, you could classify them by you know, countries, you can classify them by the places you've visited. Um, you can also add tags to all of your photos. So you can, at a later stage, maybe you've built up sort of you know, 10,000 photos over the last five years of, of being a photo blogger. You can now decide, 
if I've tagged everything by color, for example, I might decide I can just pull together a gallery and put it in a post of just everything that's tagged yellow. And I could think I could have a really cool photo gallery just of all my yellow photos, you know. And you see that kind of thing sometimes on National Geographic, and it'll be, you know, sunflowers and dunes from Namibia and, um, you know, people dressed in kind of Buddhist robes. And you can imagine that, you know, it just, it's a cool way of creating this cohesive kind of experience of all these photographs that you didn't have to think about in the first place. But because you've got a, a plugin that allows you to manage your photographs really well, and you've just done that incrementally along the way, you're now able to reap the benefits of that later on by, um, by pulling those kind of things together. Next gen's pretty cool. Um, another one is, you know, a lot of people obviously store their photos on Flickr. And a really cool thing is to be able to pull those through without really doing anything manually, pull those things through into, into your blog. And there's, you know, there's a load of plugins. The ones I'm saying here, they're ones that I made sure had sort of good responses um, that were used a lot, that they didn't seem to have any issues. But there's plenty of these things. And you know, you'll find one that fits your needs that I might not have talked about. But so this is an example of a Flickr one where you, know, you can pop a gallery into your post. Um, and you simply will type in the name of your gallery, or you put in the link from Flickr. Each one has a different way, but it's, it's pretty easy to do. Or you type in your username, and then it'll show you all of your Flickr galleries. Um, you can have stuff in a sidebar. So that means no matter what post you go to, you might be able to show always a feed from, from Flickr for your photos. Um, you know, that makes it easier for you as well, in that you don't have to upload your photos to multiple different platforms. You can just decide, I'm just going to use Flickr. And loads of people might find your photos on Flickr and come through to your blog. Um, and you don't have to worry about uploading them all again. You can just keep that as your one store for photos, the one place you manage them. And you can just feed them all through to your site uh, through the use of something like Slicker Flickr. Funny name. Um, so web video. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this, because Tristan's going to talk to you later about video um, and sort of the craft of it and also how you, how you use it in websites. I'm just going to talk about one. I think Tristan probably also will. But there's one really um, powerful plugin. And there's both a free version of this and a paid for version. Um, the paid for one obviously just has more functionality if you're trying to do something more, uh, be more flexible with it. But TubePress is um, something, once again, you can just whack into a WordPress site. And it allows you to do a lot more than simply embed a video in your post. So obviously, a lot of people embed YouTube videos in their posts. And a lot of people know how to do it. You know, you go to YouTube, you get the embed code, and you put it in. But what this allows you to do is to create a completely dynamic and fully searchable and interactive video site, really, even within just one post or one page on your site. So you can see here, there's a whole sidebar thing going on. But if we just look at this section, um, we've obviously got a lot of videos. Um, it looks kind of like YouTube in a way. You've got one video at the top, and then you've got all these previewed videos below. You can, do, you can pretty much customize everything if you want to show different bits of information. Do you want to show the time, or do you want to show the name, or not? Do you want to show the number of views on YouTube? Um, so that's cool. And you, know, you, you can do things like you can click this thumbnail, and, and this will just automatically change uh, without the page reloading. But what's really cool is, is not that you can have this, but how do you populate all these, all these videos? And you can do that in a number of different ways. So you might have a YouTube channel. So you could, for example, record videos on your phone, and you gradually build up a bunch of cool little videos on, on your YouTube channel under your username on YouTube. Um, you can now choose to just populate this with your videos from your channel. Or you could do it with videos from another channel. You, know, you could plug in Getaway's video channel, for example, and it'll show just Getaway's videos on your site in this really cool, easy to, to browse um, interface. You can also do it by search terms. So you could have, for example, a whole post about Cape Town, and you could decide just to have a little thing like this and you can say, OK, I just want to show the five most popular videos that get found on YouTube for the search term Cape Town. So just adding that is this little, it's this extra stuff for your users to interact with. That's another reason for them to remember that your site was a lot cooler than loads of other travel blogs I went to. Because every travel blog that, you know, every post that I go to, it's got this whole kind of little interactive video section at the bottom. So if I feel like it, I can just browse through these relevant videos. And for you, you know, for the person who's written the post, it's not really that much extra work to do. Um, and you're leveraging loads of other people's content that's housed on YouTube to make your blog more a richer experience, more popular. Cool. Maps. Obviously, you know, maps are not relevant for every kind of any kind every kind of blogging, but obviously for travel blogging, uh, they can be really, really important. And I say maps just because of Google Maps. Really, it's not that you know you necessarily have to have maps, but it's about making things location relevant or geolocated. Um, you know, there's a lot of tagging that can happen on online with any kind of content that attaches that piece of digital content to a physical space in the world. And, and that allows you to group other content from that place in the world, um, pull it into your blog. It allows people to find stuff on your blog by the place um, that you've associated it with, rather than you know, the category that you put it in or something. 
So you get a bunch of um, cool things like one called map press. So you can see here you, you're entering in your typing in your blog at the top um, like normal. And then you can see there, so there's a short code, for example, it says map press just up there below Paris. Um, and it allows you to associate just that post with a physical space in the world. So you can put it on a map um, and you can write a little sort of blurb about where exactly it was. And this means that when any, and then on the front end, so on the page that someone comes to and looks at your blog, they'll also see a map of where that was. Um, which is, you know, it, it's especially cool if it's, if it's not, you know, oh, this was in Africa or this was in, you know, Zambia. It's more like, you know, this is on this road in Paris. I found this really cool coffee shop and here's where it is on a map. So you don't have to go and search for it on Google Maps. It's right there. It's, it's also about providing extra functionality to people who, who come to your blog. Um, another similar one, WPGO. So it does a similar thing. Um, and both of these ones, what you can also do is start to build up a whole layer of your own on Google Maps. So it'll be like, you know, my Joseph C. Lawrence layer on, uh, on, on WordPress um, and just on my blog. So it's, it's indexing all of the spots that I've had in my posts. And yet you can now go and search on the map for my, for my posts. So say I've traveled all around the world and you kind of want to look for just stuff I've written about Thailand. Um, you don't have to type in Thailand or anything. You can just sort of visually push yourself through this map and then you'll see these little pins click on one, it'll give you a little preview of my post, and then you can click through. Um, and this kind of stuff you can just build up. You don't have to worry about like architecting or designing this whole thing. It's all just built in. And all you've done is just every post you've written, you've just said that was there, that was there, that was there. Another, um, and these are just some sort of examples of what's done with a, another plugin called Geo Mashup. Um, so this guy, this is a WordPress site. I mean, obviously it doesn't really look like a traditional blog, but this guy's for some reason, made a website that indexes all of the shark attacks that happen in the world. Um, so unfortunately, Mr. Paul Buckley in 2009 was bitten on the July 7th, somewhere around Hansby, probably. Um, but it's just an example of the fact that, you know, he's, this is a WordPress site, and this is a blog post, actually. But instead of just presenting you with, you know, a list of blog posts that you click through to and read, you actually see the whole thing in a map. And, and what's interesting is that you get to this whole extra level of meaning out of it, because I can start to see, oh, awesome, like, there's loads of shark attacks that happen here. That's great. Or, <laughs> I won't go here for my holiday. I'll rather go to Brazil, where seemingly no one gets attacked. Or at least they don't report it. Um, another example is someone has gathered together all the NGOs in India. So if you want to go and do work in NGO in India, just simply go to this website, uh, and you can see them all. But you, know, you, you obviously start to see how they're clustered around in a country. And it's, it's just an, an extra, like I said, level of meaning on top of simply blog posts, um, which everyone else is doing, right? Um, a third example, uh, Pics of Asia, once again. So if, even if it's picture content, you know, and, and these things, obviously, they're not designed in the most beautiful way, necessarily. But it's really cool to sort of flick around. And if you've been to a country, it's awesome to be able to think, oh, I went there. You remember on the map where you went. And you can click that post. And you maybe see something that you recognize. And you have that immediate kind of emotional connection with that post that you wouldn't have had if it was just perhaps a picture in the middle of a post. Um, the last one that's cool, I just discovered this whole thing, this whole, you know, you stumble across these things online, these whole realms of existence that you never knew uh, were out there. So there's this thing called Urbex, which I couldn't quite understand exactly what it is. But basically, people in America, they go and they find these old, uh, deserted, dilapidated buildings. And then they either just photograph them or they take people on tours of them. I wasn't really sure. But this guy, he's, you know, he, he's this guy who does this urbex thing, I guess urban experience. Um, he goes and he finds these places, and he's got them all on the map, as we have seen. And he'll take cool photos of them. So he found this church. Um, and he takes these really beautiful interior photographs of these places that no one's been inside for 10 years or something. They're just you know, completely dilapidated. Um, but you can just explore this thing. And you know, if you live in, this one was, I think it was in, uh, Chicago, OK. Um, you know, so if you live in Chicago and you go here, you know, you know that these streets, you know where these places are. But you might not have ever known about these small experiences that exist here. And that's a really cool thing about travel blogging is obviously you know, people letting other people in their close vicinity know about all these amazing things to do. Um, and presenting it in the form of a map which people can relate to. And they can, you, know, you know where you live. And you can see this thing is so close, but you never even realize that it existed. It's just a, a really way, cool way of doing it. Um, there's a couple of themes as well, which have this kind of stuff built in. So Woo Themes is a, is a South African WordPress-themed development company, uh, very successful, very well regarded internationally. So they make themes that allow you to do things with WordPress that are more than just blogging. Uh, an example is one called Postcard, which does what we've just been talking about. It basically tags all your posts on a map um, so people can browse through them. Another one, oh, and also so every post then will have uh, the map 
included as well, just as default without you really having to do much about it. Um, another one, city guide, pretty much the same, just a different kind of design. And you can see immediately the kind of professional design that you can get. And this theme probably costs you, you know, maybe it's 50 US dollars or whatever. Um, and immediately you have this really, you know, slick looking site that does this cool thing. And you didn't really have to do anything about it. You just basically outsourced, you know, programming work to someone for the cost of 50 US dollars. Um, and you've now got something that's standing out from the crowd, basically. Okay, enough of location. Onto the social layer. So, uh, obviously, everyone knows that social media is, you know, hugely important, and it's a huge part of building anything online now. Um, so, the social layer is just this kind of layer that's been laid on top of everything that we do online now. It's, you know, the way that we interact with friends, the way that we find content, the way that we share content. Um, so, you know, with with anything and and, and blogging especially, perhaps, um, if you can build a sense of community on your site or around your site or around what you offer people online. That can be really powerful because that means that people are coming back repeatedly. It also means that people are sharing stuff and it means that people are talking about the things that you're doing to each other um, and not necessarily even just to you. Um, so that can, you know, it can build um, you know, repeat visits, it can entice new ones. Um, so, but the important thing to remember is that, well there's two things here, communities can draw from larger ones. So you don't have to feel like you have to create this whole community of your own. You know, there are communities that exist already on things like Facebook and Twitter. You know, there are networks of people that regularly communicate with each other about certain subjects, and you can leverage that to, to build your own sort of sub-community. Um, and the other thing was, I was just thinking about how they really have to be you know, seen to be believed, meaning that you've got to show people that there is a community for them to understand that there is one. Um, and I'll show you a few things with, with uh, WordPress plugins that do that. So firstly, how do you get people to share your content? Well, um, we all know about these buttons that exist on practically every website you see these days. You know, okay, Buzz, that's outdated, obviously. But tweet buttons, Facebook share buttons, all of this kind of stuff. This is one plugin that I like to use. It's called Dig Dig. It's just not like the the, but. Um, so yeah, I only found one relevant to Java programming, not to travel blogging, but um, yeah, this kind of stuff, you know, it can automatically pop it on every post of your site. Easily people can just share that stuff. Um, push it out to social networks, their friends see it, their friends come, their friends like it, their friends come. And so obviously a snowball effect. Once again, you know, depending on the, the popularity of your, of your content. Um, another cool one, Facebook comments. So this is something that Facebook offers everyone in the world to use for free. So you can have on your website, instead of having the normal WordPress comments, you can use a, a plugin to have Facebook comments. So what this means is, I, I don't have to sign in. You know, mostly on a website when you leave a comment, you put your name, your email address, perhaps your website, and then you type the comment, and then it goes for approval, and then you, maybe it comes up, and then maybe someone one day clicks on that and comes through to your website or something. Uh, instead, you can have something like Facebook comments. So there's a few benefits to this. One is, um, anyone who comments on that blog post on Facebook even, you'll see that all mixed into the string of comments. So you can have comments appearing from people that you didn't even know, that never even uh, saw yourself, never communicated with each other, and they're all kind of pulled in together, which can be really cool. Another thing is that you, you get a lot less um, spammy comments. You get a lot less, you know, especially if, if you think of things like, it's not such a problem on travel blogs, but on big media sites in South Africa, you get like basically racial hatred, right? It's like the whole comments are just racial hatred. That's, that's what it seems to be, or violence, whatever. Um, you get a lot less of that because there's accountability because obviously it's tied to someone's name. This is your personal Facebook account. You're not going to be doing dodgy, writing dodgy things in the comment under your name. Um, another one, simple Facebook Connect. So this allows you to do a couple of things. You can have a, um, a like box in your, in your sidebar. So this is an easy way. If you have a getaway, I'm sorry, if you have a Facebook page um, for your blog, it can allow people to see the conversation that's going on there, easily like it from there, see which of their friends or how many people, how many people like the page. Um, so that's cool to, as I was saying, you know, the, the communities have to be seen to be believed. If you see something like that, it, it gives immediate um, credence to, your, to the popularity of your blog. And that, you know, people like things that are popular already. You know, it's, it's sort of been given social, it's social collateral or so there's some strange geeky term for it. Um, another thing is that it allows people to easily sign up to your blog. So if you're, you know, at a certain stage where you've got enough readership and you think, you want to be doing emails. So for example, you know, Getaway will send out emails about photography tips or it might be a food email. You know, you can get people's email addresses easily just by them being able to click and say, yes, I sign up with Facebook. And it's much easier for them. It's much more likely that they'll do it. Um, and you can gather that information and start to build your own community out of it. Same things can be true of Twitter. So here's another example. You know, it's just a much easier way. It's a lot more professional. Um, it's, it's great functionality to have and people will, will more likely leave more comments and will leave better comments if they can sign in with Twitter and connect with Facebook. 
Um, another added bonus is if, if they do things like that, you can also have it that it automatically pushes their comment out to Facebook or Twitter. So they'll leave a comment on your blog post and then it'll say like on Twitter, I just left a comment on Lardy Blah's blog or whatever. Um, or on Facebook, I just left a comment on Thingy's blog. And that's just an extra link out there that, that you know, allows people to come and visit your blog, discover it for the first time, or discover that there's this conversation going on around your content, which is, which is really cool. And then similar with the, the Facebook thing, you can obviously easily with plugins just pull in your Twitter feed and your sidebar, see all that kind of stuff. Once again, it's just an indication that you know, there is, your, your site is alive. It's not just this static content of, of posts. It's not just this you putting out posts, you broadcasting stuff. It's, a, it's an illustration to someone that comes in that this, this is like a living site. It's a living thing um, that you can interact with and that's changing every day and that people are constantly talking about. That kind of thing is really attractive. So winding down to the, the kind of end point, um, Delight is this, fine, this sort of pinnacle on top. And uh, recently or a couple of years ago, someone converted Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is this you know, psychological sort of uh, theory where, where Maslow represented the, the hierarchy of human needs in a, in a pyramid, right, or a triangle with the basic ones at the bottom, stuff like food and shelter and, and physical safety, uh, and then you know, going up to stuff like being part of a community and, and this kind of stuff, culminating at the top in self-actualization, the T-put it up, which is this thing that is only achievable once you have all the base things uh, taken care of. So um, in terms of user experience design, someone has cleverly reappropriated that. And at the bottom, you've got usability. So you know, making sure that my website actually works, that I can find stuff that I want. And it goes up through various stages. You know, is it aesthetically pleasing? But right at the top, you get this, this pinnacle of delight. And so delight is really this, what I like to think of as the, the kind of emotional icing on top. And I think um, you know, we heard earlier about how it's really that emotional connection which is the most important thing. You have to have the other things taken care of to get there, because obviously, if it's just a, re a really annoying site or travel blog to use, no one's going to come back. But once you have taken care of all those things, you can start to work towards creating an emotional connection with people, which is the most powerful thing. Um, so yeah, like, like I was saying, it, it, it's really making people love you. And you know, you think of things like Apple products, and you know, there's this whole hype and this mad sort of. Um, um, aura of amazingness around them and you know you hear people like I love my iPhone, love my iPhone. Um, you know no one says that about like I love my Nokia 3310, it's awesome. <laughs> and the reason is you know they've taken care of all that, you know it works amazingly but there's just this something, how do they do it? You know it's got this personality, it's got this this sort of softness or this there's something that just, just makes you have this emotional connection with these products. Um, and that's the thing that's really you know it's hard to do but if you can do it then you, you can build amazing success off the back of that. Um, so, you know, and the reason that it's so powerful, if you can do it, is that it makes people remember you, right? You remember their emotional experience much more than just one that allowed you to find a piece of content about the pyramids or something, you know? And those are the kind of things that you share as well. And they don't have to be happy emotional, you know, it's best that they're not angry and hatred, but they can be sad things as well. Um, there's a really interesting fact about the way that Facebook does a lot of its um, uh, user experience stuff. And it's, it's not visual, it's more about considering the way people feel about other people, and, and they work that into their interface. So, I mean, Facebook's in a lucky position where obviously almost everything on there is emotional because it's about your friends and your family. But they do things like, if you've been in a relationship with someone on Facebook and then you're not in a relationship with, any, with them anymore, and then that person gets like, in a relationship with someone else, um, they won't show you pictures in the sidebar of that person in their new relationship because they realize that that's not probably going to be that cool for you to see. Um, so they don't show it to you. So, Overall, you're going to have a slightly better experience on Facebook than if you were constantly seeing pictures of your ex with their new boyfriend or girlfriend. Right? And they engineer that experience. Like, they're thinking, what is this person going to feel when they see this content on Facebook? And how can we change that to make sure that they feel good about it and not bad about it? And if they feel good about it, they're going to keep coming back and they're going to like using my service, my piece of software, Facebook, um, more than if I keep showing them things that make them feel shitty. You know? um, so. Yeah, there's all kinds of things that you can do to, to impact on that. So, you know, and, and pictures and copy obviously immediately already have the power, an amazing power to have an emotional, uh, to create an emotional experience with people. Um, and then it comes down to the more, the more subtle kind of softer things like, like personality, right? So, you know, like what Cameron was talking about, about finding a voice for your writing, that can be incredibly important in, in forming personal connections with people. So you might have a million people reading your blog, but each one of them can, have, can feel like they have a personal connection with you because you've built up a certain personality. And you even get that now in interfaces and pieces of software. So if you think of something like Twitter, you know, Twitter was one of the first um, big pieces of software to start using personality in the interface. So I don't know how many of you know Twitter, but they've got this thing called the fail whale. So you know, most software 
when you get to a page where it wasn't available or the system was broken, you would just say, you would say system unavailable or you know, page not found or whatever. And Twitter had this thing where they got this whale and it's kind of like cute and it's animated and it's being flown around by these little birds and they'd be like, this is the fail whale, so sorry, you got the fail whale. And immediately that's, that's funny, right, it's cool. It's, I'm not feeling now just pissed off, I'm feeling just a little bit pissed off, but also kind of like, ah, oh, that's funny. Maybe not the 20th time you see it, but at least the first time, it allows you to, you start thinking of Twitter as a person, and it does have a personality, right? Twitter doesn't talk to you in a formal tone. It doesn't talk to you, doesn't talk down to you if you make mistakes. Um, you know, it's playful, and those kind of things, once you take on a, a personality, it enables that emotional connection which can be so powerful. Um, so yeah, here's um, some just sort of more elaborate or popular WordPress sites that have, that have uh, done some really cool stuff. This is one called travellogic.intios.com, not a great domain name. Um, but this guy has mapped out these whole journeys that he's done um, in a map, and then his post content sits here. So you can see the whole journey as a, as a line from his you know, initial starting point all the way to the destination. And then along the bottom, he's got this, this timeline that you can click and you can drag it along, and you can see everything change as you drag it along. So you know, he's created this experience that he's communicating to you um, both the, the location and the physical sort of uh, occurrences of all, of all of his experiences, but also he's, he's showing you through time. And he's got a little thing here, how many miles that was gone. So as you drag it, you not only go through time, but you also go through the distance that he's traveled. Um, and as you drag it, you start to see different posts come up. So you, know, you drag it along, and then map zooms in, and you can see, oh, awesome, you know, that's in the Masai Mara. Maybe I know it, maybe I don't know it. Uh, and, and here's his post about it, which is dated like a normal post, and he's got photos in it. And I can scroll this, uh, and the map stays in the same place. And I can scroll a bit further, and, uh, and I just start to see. And I can, you know, I can viscerally experience his journey much more than just following a normal blog. And it's about being sort of creative and, and, and thinking outside of what normally occurs or what you normally expect on a blog to achieve these kind of um, special experiences. Um, another one that's really popular, the, the V Traveled blog, which uh, is, a, is a virgin um, travel blog, also built on WordPress. And I mean, you start to see, once again, you know, the range of kind of look and feel and stuff that you can get. You can get a theme for free that will look pretty much like this, and immediately you've got a blog that, that looks cool that people will remember. Um, and I'm sure loads of you know the Matador network. Um, so this is basically the most popular travel writing network. Um, yeah, I had to wait for ages. The thing was sliding past, and I was trying to take a screenshot. And all the other ones are boring, like, you know, like, oh, best tea in Egypt or whatever. And there was this one, and I was just waiting, and got it. Um, so yeah, the Matador network, I mean, it's, 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 very, it's very popular. It's probably the most widely read and widely written on um, travel blogging network. The whole thing is run on WordPress. So just another example of how scalable it is. So you, know, you can start off as a, a blogger with you know, a, couple of people who, a couple of hundred people who read your blog a month. Um, and maybe in five years' time, you're really popular. And if you've chosen WordPress and you've thought always about, about the experience, um, you, know, you, you can scale it up really well. And that's the final point, really, that I want to kind of leave you with is just when you do anything, really, when you, when you write a story or a post, and when you take a photograph, not take a photograph, when you decide how to present the photograph, um, or when you shoot video and put a video on your blog, and when you, when you decide, you know, how do I want my home page to look? What options do I have um, in the theme that I've gotten or whatever? Always, always don't think about what do I like, what looks nice to me. That's completely irrelevant, because you're not the person who's reading it. You're probably the one person in the world who's not actually reading your blog, or is never going to read your blog. The whole point is, Who's going to be reading my blog? Let me think about them. Let me think about what kind of people they are. Are they Cape Town people? You know, are they international people? Um, international people. Um, you know, and, and when I think about those kind of people, and then I imagine, who are you? What do you want to see when you get here? And what are you going to feel when you look at this? So look at yourself as well. It's like what uh, Cameron was saying earlier about reading your stuff aloud. You know, also go visit your blog and look at it and think, like, if I came to a site like this, how would I feel? Would I feel kind of overwhelmed by the amount of copy? Or would I feel this is really easy to engage with? Give yourself those little tests, um, you know, those little kind of like two second tests, uh, and you can really increase the, or enhance the experience that you're putting out there, um, which ultimately should get more people visiting your blog, more people loving your blog, more people sharing your blog, and ultimately that makes you um, a lot more successful. Thank you very much. And if anyone's got any questions. <laughs>